talk a little bit about the future, and um, I, I have some questions that I'd be interested in thoughts on. So, first of all, modelers and model domains. Um, numerical modelers are very interested in their algorithms and their solvers, and they relate their models to the real world. But um, the relation is somewhat interesting. So there's an old tale that I was told when I was a physics student about a uh, um, physicist who was asked to help a uh, set of farmers in their dairy farms, and his first response was that they were going to consider a spherical cow, and the spherical cow would have a constant input of grass, and that was the world, and then they could start modelling. So that's the kind of uh, attitude that we work with. So this is an example of a limited area numerical model that we've plotted. Um, this is plotting over a standard plat carry projection, and you can see that the model domain is a slightly interesting shape. Um, you, um, I've plotted each one of the cells individually on this model. It's quite a coarse model. I'll come back to exactly, um, some, well, not exactly some more details on this projection in just a moment. Um, this is taking the world the other way around. So in this example, we're looking at the world on a plat carry projection and then drawing the model data as best we can over the top of it. This is looking at the model domain and then plotting the coastlines relative to the model space. So these two are exactly the same data, just flipping the point of reference around. So while plotting is very important to the people who we work with, another thing that's very important to them is resampling. So some of this is to do with interpolation, and people are very interested in the interpolation schemes and what's being used. Um, and this can have quite an effect on the kinds of modeling that they want to do. And then there are a number of different types of resampling which need to be um, addressed for some of the more esoteric problems. So the picture I've showed you on here is a global model. And if we just zoom in over the UK, there is a limited area model nested on top of this. So these domains are defined quite differently. And for this particular use case, what we're looking at is the global model temperature and the limited area model temperature. The global model is a baseline, and people want to do an anomaly plot of the difference between the temperature in a particular run and some anomaly set across the globe. So we have to do a quite careful resampling of one data set onto the other before we can do the simple numbers one minus the other to do the anomalies. So that's a little bit about the kind of challenges we're facing. I'd like to talk now about the coordinate reference systems themselves. So the first one that we're looking at here is what's called a rotated pole. So they've taken a normal geographic coordinate system and then they have moved the North Pole. And the reason they've done this is that on a plat carré projection, then there are a very large number of squares near the North Pole and near the South Pole, which means that they have a very, very small area, and that upsets the numerical solvers. You get um, sinks at um, the place where the cell area tends to zero, and it really gets, um, causes them problems. So they have to deal with it in their global models, but for the local models, they move that to somewhere they don't care about, and just look at the part where the, where, where the grid is nice and square. So here, we're looking at the UK and the North Atlantic. So everything is square around us. And what happens in Central Asia doesn't matter because the solver isn't going to go there. So I picked up a little di diagram just to try and show you what we've done. We've taken a geographic coordinate system, as Frank was just talking about. And then we've added two new parameters to it. One is the location of the North Pole. We've given that in the old coordinate system. This one happens to be moved by 90 degrees, but different models will move by different amounts. And then some people also f do a further rotation of the globe so that they can shift the meridian, or, or to give them a nice model space where they want it. So what I've just been looking at are what I would term parameterized coordinate systems. We've got a, a simple um, set of numbers, we can do a small transformation, and everything can be handled by, by the maths. The other kind of problem that we have is what I've termed a translated coordinate reference system. I don't know if that's a widely used name, but in this case, um, these people have decided that the most important areas for them are over the Arctic Ocean and the various other oceans around the globe, because they happen to be ocean modelers. So to do this, they've created two North Poles rather than just one. One over Canada and one over, um, I suppose, central Russia. Um, it's probably a little bit south of that. But this presents us with quite an interesting domain to work with. And as you can see, there are areas where the domain simply isn't defined at all. 
and there are areas where there's significant warping taking place. So in this case, what we have is that each cell in the model domain is defined in terms of its centre and its corners. We also have the area of a cell parameterized. They give us some information about the connectivity, which cells connect to what and perhaps in what direction. But this doesn't give us a full picture. So one of my questions and one of the things that we've been puzzling over slightly is, is this really a coordinate reference system? Is it helpful for us to try and treat it as that? because the kind of work that we want to do with these is very similar to what we do with a rotated pole, is very similar to what we do with a geographic coordinate system or a projected coordinate system. So we can see how the requirements fit together, but do we have enough information? Is this um, a worthwhile approach? I've showed you the ocean model grid, which is their tripolar grid. There are a whole suite of those for different resolutions for different purposes. And that's being used by a lot of climate research and weather forecasting, ocean modeling communities now. But the thought process about how you're going to build a numerical domain is going on in a lot of other areas. And I've got two more examples here of ways of defining a domain which are gaining credence, particularly amongst the people who are developing numerical algorithms. One of the reasons for this is that as computing power and storage potential increases, then the modelers want more. The limiting factor for most of them is time. They have a certain amount of time on a piece of hardware to run a model, and the model has to solve. If you want to give a six-hour forecast, and you're starting at midnight, and you want to give a forecast for noon, it doesn't really help if your forecast returns back at six o'clock in the evening, because nobody cares anymore. So windows of time are very important. So every time you give them a new supercomputer with an order of magnitude more processing power, they increase the resolution of their grid in time and space by that proportion so it fits into the same model time. As they've done that, the plat carry projection, or sorry, the plat carry um, coordinate reference system has more and more problems, particularly around the poles. So they're all wanting to move away from it. And I've got a couple of examples here that are being talked about. Um, I quite like the yin-yang grid. That, that's quite pretty. Um, the um, cube sphere domain stretched across on, onto the globe is um, heavily researched at the moment and there are some models being run in the Met Office in some experimental configurations using that particular one. But the reason I show these is from my perspective these share a lot of characteristics with the ocean model grid. The modelers just tell us a cell and they give us some information about that cell and that's all you get back from the model. It says here I've got a data value. And then they want to plot that on the map. They want to resample that. There, there's a number of other operations they want to do. As these become more popular, they're coming to the tool builders and saying, we want you to help us support this. So I showed you earlier a nice plot of the um, rotated pole data in its own domain with the coastlines warped around to give you a nice coastline plot. This is a plot of the ocean model, seawater potential temperature. Um, I think it's near the surface. You can see kind of where the world is. But because we don't currently treat this as a true coordinate reference system, we can't use the same tool to plot the coastlines. And um, there are some interesting features, particularly around Africa. If you know your African geography, then that, that, that's not, 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 not a good representation. So um, I've talked quite a bit about transforming coordinate reference systems. That's one of the key requirements that, as tool builders, we're being presented with. We use Proj4 extensively. So we find it a very nice toolkit. We've written a Python library, which hooks into Proj4 and connects that to the Python matplotlib plotting library, which is what we were making the graphics with. And that provides a really useful set of tools for handling our rotated pole grids and a number of other requirements that we have. Um, there's an obtrans function in um, Proj4, which does everything we need for the rotated poles. But when it comes to what I've called these translated coordinate reference systems, we're not aware of how to do this. We haven't approached this problem. And from one perspective, I think that there is an interesting idea that says we should be approaching it in this way, and this is the kind of functionality that we want. But I'm, I'm not convinced, and I haven't seen all of the answers yet. So that's one of the reasons I've come here, is to get some more opinions is this a good idea, or is this a whole world of pain that I will come back in a year's time saying, I wish we'd never gone down that road. I, I really, really wish we hadn't. 
The other requirement that we have, as well as the functional processing, is about specification. So people are creating data. Um, there's two different perspectives here, which I'll just touch on very quickly. From the weather forecaster's perspective, they make a forecast. They'll release it at 4 o'clock tomorrow morning, and it will have a forecast for 12 o'clock, um, 6 in the evening, 12 o'clock, maybe up to 5 days, maybe up to 7 days. When they do the same thing 12 hours later, the last one doesn't really matter. All anybody wants is the latest information. The climate research are in a very different pos pos position because they're looking at doing runs out to 100, 150 years, managing many, many different scenarios. So they're very interested in the data archiving problem and they've got uh, requirements to go back to data that was created 10, 15 years ago and be able to use that now and compare it to things that they're doing. Um, there's a huge project called the Climate Model Intercomparison Study which has hundreds of terabytes of data from the last 10 years of climate research, which is being used for the International Panel on Climate Change report, which is just being published at the moment and will be all over your newspapers with various opinions around it. Um, so we need to be able to specify these and specify these to high quality. And particularly for the climate researchers, we need standards and we need some way that we can trust we'll still be there in 10 years' time. Um, the EPSG, which um, Frank was talking about earlier, um, we found quite difficult because as the model has come up with new ideas, it's been quite hard to work out how you get new coordinate systems in, particularly when there's a fast pace. And when it comes to the rotated poles, um, it's a parametric definition. The rotated pole is easy to define, but each modeler wants to be able to give you new parameters. And the idea of EPSG codes giving you an exact answer doesn't really fit that model for us. We've been looking at well-known text, and particularly, um, I, I unpacked the alphabet soup underneath, but I had to make it quite small. I'm sorry about that. But there is a special working group in the OGC looking at revamping um, the coordinate reference system well-known text, and I'm interested about whether that provides the long-term mechanism and whether that's really going to hit what we need. Um, I've started making, having discussions with some of those people. Um, about giving them the rotated pole use case to say, could you please support this? Because at the moment, we can't put that in well-known text. One other thing I wanted to mention, there's a very um, widely used standard within the climate research community called the Climate and Forecasting Conventions for NetCDF, um, which is shortened to CF, NetCDF. Um, this has been quite domain-specific. It's been very focused on climate research. Because of the kind of requirements I've been talking about, they've come up with their own method for specifying coordinate reference systems. And there's been some work recently looking at how they can try and either use another methodology or map that methodology onto another one. But this is very heavily in use in our community, and it's not clear how that gets out into the geographic communities or how it might be able to be used with GIS software or other such things. So um, I've got some questions, so I'd like to take a little bit of time, if we've got a little bit left, to open up the, the floor to discussion. I'm going to put my questions up in front of you. I'm very happy to take any other questions you have on what I've talked about, but um, this is one of the reasons that I came here. I, I'd like to find out more information about this. So the first question I have is about how do we standardise definition of coordinate reference systems? What, what's our best approach for this? My second one is, is it useful to treat these translated coordinate reference systems as coordinate reference systems? Should we be trying to push these kinds of definitions into tools that we already use, um, particularly Proj4, which has been um, very effective in delivering to a lot of our use cases? And as I said, any other questions that you have, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to try and discuss. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's confusing. I've yeah. tried four or five different terms. I'm yet to find a good one that, that seems to... Um, you see, what 
what the confusion is in this one. If you if you read it out like this, anybody having to do with with, with coordinate system would say, no, no, of course not, because it's a coordinate reference system that that's been defined, and then you translate. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, translation, my answer translation is a perfectly legitimate form of another coordinate system. I mean, it's the same as you could have transverse rotator with false piece ignoring a zero, and you could have another one with a different yeah, false. Those that, are both coordinate systems, that, and one's a translation of the other. Clear, but that that uh, supposes that then you, you it, it is not what he means because then it's not nothing new or different. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. I, if I could add a comment, uh, yeah, I, would, I would like to say that uh, in the raster world, I'm used to having one set of modeling, which is how we get from our raster space to some sort of GIS coordinate system space, and then we get from that coordinate system space to some other coordinate system space. So I would be norm I would normally treat these as situations where maybe I have a geolocation array for my raster mm -hmm. that maps it into the sort of normal coordinate system, yep. and then the next stage, or uh, you know RPC. There are different, there are various different mo mechanisms, but I'm used to trying to treat the, the phase where you go from an irregular raster into sort of a regular GIS coordinate system as one distinct operation, which I don't try and represent in the same well known text or you know it's actually a completely different thing in my flow model. Conceptually they could all be put together, but to me it's easier for me to understand what's going on when I treat that step as distinct from the sort of uh, reprojection step or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Because I think one of the challenges that we have is that and when we get data out of the models using particularly these ocean models, then the data set will give us, if you've got, if you just consider a surface field, you'll have a 2D array of data, you'll have a 2D array of latitudes, and a 2D array of longitudes, and a 2D array of areas, and then a 2 by 4 array of corners. So for any data value, I can give you a cell in that I can tell you the center, for whatever you mean by center, the four corners, which may give you a slightly odd shape, and then some parameters about that cell. So I can put that on a map, and I can, I can do a drawing, and I can draw some nice shapes. But if I want to go the other way around and say, well, okay, can you take something that exists in space, like a coastline, and tell me how that looks in index space? We can't do that. We don't have a me methodology for doing that at the moment. And that's something that we can do very neatly for the rotated poles. Because we've got an, a mathematical transform, and I'll give you a rotated pole data set, I'll just draw the coastlines behind it, and that works beautifully. So we've shown our ocean modelers that bit of functionality, and they've gone, oh, can we have that? And we went back a couple of months later and said, um, no, not now. Um. I mean, so GDAL has uh, a geolocation transformer, which is roughly that, except without the coordinate form. It's just the center of each pixel. Mm -hmm. And that is, loosely speaking, invertible. Now, this is actually, you, you actually work with some cases where it might get lost because it assumes that there's some regularity to it, and interruptions will cause problems. But one would assume that with, with uh, some work and, I don't know, I shouldn't say a little luck, but anyway, you know, with the understanding that there are irregularities where you might have to go to a more expensive solution, it seems like you could make it sort of invertible. Um, and in fact, the way I've done it in, in the Warper is I take the ge geolocation array that goes one way and then I actually sort of resample that geolocation array into a new one, which is the inverse of it. Okay. Like holes or interpolate or something like that. So it's, it's still, it, I can imagine there's pathological cases where that's going to fall apart, but for things that are reasonably yeah. regular, that's been adequate for my Okay. Purpose. So you've used GDAL Warper for that. That's not something that you tried to do with Proj4. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So, so that's why I say I, I have that raster to coordinate system space as sort of a separate thing. So then that CDF driver, for instance, can read the uh, Latin long arrays, the three sided of what I call the geolocation array in GDAL. Yeah. And so there's a transformer that uses that. So I've normally only used it for things that were somewhat irregular, but not interrupted or, you know, that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm It would get lost. It would fail to resolve the inversion. But it, anyway, it seems like that, that's how I would be inclined to approach it. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Hello. So I, I came across some um, rotating pole data from the ACDO 9 yep. recently. Um, and after a day of trying to figure out how to get it on a huge site, it gave up. Yep. Um, so is, is that something I could use to. Uh, the, the people I work with don't really care. Yeah. So um, I think there's. Th I'd give two answers to that. The first one is if they just want to see some data, if they just want a picture, then I'd resample the data. I, I'd try and resample from the rotated pole onto something that QGIS would understand. 
Um, so um, we've got Python tools which we've written specifically f um, to meet some of these use cases. So I mentioned one called Carterpy. There's another tool that we've written called Iris, which is a data management tool. But that would give you some tools to do a resampling onto a coordinate system that um, they could work with um, if they particularly wanted to use QGIS. If they just want a picture, then the Iris and Carterpy tools will do that and just give you pictures. And it uses a plotting engine. The ones, the pictures that I was showing earlier, are coming straight out of those tools. So I can provide you information about those. Um, those are free and open tools. In fact, they're on your um, OSGO CD that you got from the conference. So you can experiment um, with one there and ha have a little play around. Um, but if you are going to go down the route of resampling the data, then the people who are doing it do need to be aware that you are changing the data at the point where you're resampling it. So the, you, you need to apply a little bit of caution, and particularly if you're changing the resolution at the same time. So um, don't assume that you're getting exactly the same numbers. It, it doesn't quite work like that. I would just add to that, if, if you're getting them in a NetCDF file that has the latitude and longitude uh, layers, and if you model that properly, properly, you should be able to say if you don't work, you're in input file, input file, it would produce uh, going that outlier transform file. So often, often the uh, metadata Okay, well, um, thank you very much.